So I started the hard drive, started the Facebook. Okay. And this is Ham Radio Now. Center myself in the camera a little bit. The most important amateur radio program on the internet. Nobody else can make that claim. Well, no one else is bothering to make that claim. Uh, and we're going to do um, episode 388, Florida Spectrum Management. That's all I could squeeze in on the title. Uh, I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. Ham Radio Now is brought to you by Arvin at hamradionow.tv. Send him money. And uh, let's uh, get to the guest. Here is um, Brian with a Y Fields. Boy, I don't like the way my uh, computer is uh, not not responding very well. So we'll see how, how this goes. So here's Brian Fields, W9CR, of the Florida Amateur Spectrum Management Association. Welcome back to Ham Radio Now. You've been on many times. Uh, I've been on a couple times, mainly for uh, Tapper DCC stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we did one show just just talking, I think, on Skype. Yeah, yeah, we, we did. Uh, previously, the uh, I think it was relating to some of the issues with the Florida Repeater Console, and uh, I'm not going to rehash a lot of the, the history there. It, it's there if people want to see it, but um, we uh, had some issues with the Florida Repeater Console. The, the membership uh, got together and uh, decided we needed to go in a different direction, and now... Uh, at the end of last year, uh, it was decided because um, we, we wanted to go for the uh, nonprofit status, uh, 501c3 status. The previous Florida Repeater Council had never uh, really filed a federal tax return or, or any <laughs> stuff like that. So were they incorporated? Uh, they were incorporated in the state. So they should have. Uh, they were incorporated as, as such, but it never happened. So uh, we started FASMA, the Florida Amateur Spectrum Management Association, to be a little bit more inclusive than the repeater console so that uh, it, you know, amateurs in the state of Florida can join it and be members. Uh, we want uh, input from the guys doing the weak signal portion of the band. We primarily do repeater coordination, but we need to have input from everybody that's using the band so that we don't inadvertently cause problems um, and by having that input we can we can avoid that but so and, and Re repeaters are the 800 pound gorilla yeah of um, spectrum use in VHF and UHF but there is other stuff as you say uh, th and there's a lot of other stuff and we need to be cognizant of what they're doing out there um, remember when I was involved in Sarah back in the uh, late 90s early 2000s when packet radio was a thing and Sarah said we pack we coordinate repeaters we don't coordinate packet packet might have been difficult to coordinate but it still needed something and Sarah wouldn't do it they they said we would they would help but they didn't want to do lists and and you can do this and you can do that so they they stayed away from it uh, being more inclusive is probably a good idea uh, yes yes it, it certainly is now what we did at the end of last year is we decided it would make sense to do uh, kind of an asset transfer and a IP trans an intellectual property transfer of the FRC assets uh, into the new 501c3 corporation, which is the Florida Amateur Spectrum Management or FASMA. And we transferred that. We're now operating as FASMA. Uh, we have a steering committee that's putting together uh, some initial bylaws uh, so that we're going to have a provision, very importantly, for membership of individuals and also of organizations. So if your repeater, you know, if your club has a coordinated repeater, they can appoint somebody to, you know, vote on board business and things such as that, have a voice for the organizational users, which previously didn't exist. Now, we're taking uh, input also from the membership and uh, trying to figure out how we're going to fund going forward as well in that you know the AWRL has outsourced its repeater directory to to our finder and getting paid for repeater coordination listings doesn't really happen so we're exploring a couple different ways to do that the league used to pay a pretty substantial amount mm -hmm. to coordinators to get that information for the repeater director so they're not paying for it anymore no they're not uh, they, they will uh, pay for it through our finder if they're kind of the exclusive access to it. And in our founding documents, in our Articles of Incorporation, 
we're actually subject as a nonprofit corporation in the state of Florida to uh, the Florida Open Records Act. So th- this is important because the previous organization wasn't very open. And when people asked questions, they became even less open. So we said the way to solve that is if you give us something, it's going to be a record and we're going to have to disclose it if somebody asks, which shouldn't be an issue for any corporation. We want people to know what we're doing, where the money's going, uh, if money is being spent. Uh, To date, we've not really spent much other than, I think, about uh, maybe $180 for printing a banner (laughs) and and purchasing very, ni- very uh, nice looking banner. Uh, thank you. We had actually had professional help with that. Somebody that was a graphics artist, and uh, I have such an appreciation for the graphic artists that are out there. It it seems so easy to look at, uh, but there's so much time involved in that. So that's uh, that's how we're 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 blessed to have a good amount of money in the bank right now, but we need to figure out a way to fund going forward uh, because we don't want to just spend that down and not have a solution. So, so w- without re- yeah. without relitigating and fighting the the old fight. The old the, the previous um, folks running the Florida Repeater Council didn't want to let it go, but it appears that that finally they did that they that they relinquish it at least um, gentlemanly. Um uh, y- yes, I mean uh, there was no further challenges. We called a uh, a special meeting. Yeah, uh, put that on YouTube. Yeah, there was an emergency members meeting called that the a couple of the board members from the uh, FRC board at the time did show up. Uh, there was some finding of facts, and we had basically the members did not stand for it, and uh, we removed the current board. We removed the bylaws that were put in place by them that uh, very famously in in February of 2017 at their meeting they removed all the members from the organization yeah. which is I, I anyways it was we, weird yes it, 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 ver- it was very weird it would be akin to the uh, AWRL removing the members from the league yeah. you know so they, they could do a, a couple things to impede a, a changeover that first of all they could withhold all the records and second they could try to stay in business and keep doing what they were doing and you would be starting a second parallel organization neither of those appears to have happened no they 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 did not and i i want to say one thing our the the former treasurer of the uh, organization um uh, uh doug stewart uh, i believe was his name uh i i haven't really talked with him but a couple of our other board members now did and he did uh, a, a lot of good for the organization, for, for managing the money, and for making certain that the records and the finances were preserved. I, I would like people to know that, uh, you know, I, I think he kind of got caught up in a lot of the stuff. He really had a desire to serve uh, radio amateurs. And he, he did some great stuff in that regard, uh, making the transition much easier. So I, I would like to publicly recognize him for that and for his assistance. This kind of transition is not totally unique. It's happened before. I don't, in my history with repeater councils, which goes back into the 70s, there's always been the disgruntlement factor with people out there not happy with the way things are done. Um, and there, there have been challenges, and, well, we're going to start up our own group. Uh, the, the FCC rules are, are very small when it comes to what Peter Coordination Authority can be. Uh, so a transition like this where there has been some pushback and then finally it actually gets thoroughly accomplished, um, it, it might have been a happier thing, a happier way to do it, but this is the way it got done. And I guess the bottom line is it got done. Yeah, it, it did get done. Um, I, I keep in mind this is something that's been happening over the last three and a half to four years now, and we approached as you know, hat in hand, trying to solve problems, and um, kind of were rebuffed. And unfortunately, uh, there is some acrimony uh, that happened during this. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think it was necessarily wrong, but I wish it would have been a bit easier. Uh, This is what's really important is, as a repeater organization, 
a repeater console or you know, somebody doing coordination, all we can do is make a suggestion for a suggested operating practice. And the amateurs really should follow that suggestion, but we can't force that. And the way to get people to, to recognize that is, well, if, if you go along with our suggestion and operate your repeater with the right tones and the right power output, and you know, if you want to move it or increase the power, let us know. We'll figure out how to do it. Um, that's, that's what's really important to stress. We're here to work with the community. We're not here to dictate. And, and, and not every repeater council, but, but some, got um, a uh, power hunger you know, syndrome, a royalty syndrome, and they thought they, they did run everything. Yeah, and we also want to dispel the myth that somebody owns a frequency, even if you're coordinated there. You don't own a frequency. Nobody does. So in amateur radio, there seems to be a thing. People like to say, well, it's my frequency. I've had it for so long. <laughs> and, you know, they lose their sight. They, they become the repeaters off the air for five years. You know, if somebody comes and says, I want to put a repeater up there, and you don't have a repeater on that frequency, well, okay, you, you, you lose that frequency. Yeah. That may be the most important thing to talk about, um, which I'd like to get into in a minute. And it, your time is limited, so mm -hmm. we could do repeater talk for hours and hours. And we can't. We can't do that. Um, so we'll talk about the paper repeater issue and how you guys are going to deal with that. And maybe that. Maybe that's you know, the big thing that we'll we'll center on. But as I'm looking at this now, it's sort of like, well, you guys are like the dog that chased the car and caught it, and so now you got to run it. So how have you dealt with, okay, now this is our baby. we got to do this. So we have uh, several excellent people involved in this right now on our board. Uh, we're also pulling in some people as, um, I, I should say, kind of eyes and ears of the organization, uh, kind of to report what's going on in certain areas of the state. Um, but what we've, uh, what we've done is... We have now a ticketing system in place, so very similar to like IT help desk sort of stuff. And you email us. It just doesn't go to a board member and get dropped. It actually opens a ticket, and all our board members see it, all our coordination committee people see it, and allows us to all comment on something if it needs that, or one person can claim it and work it. This is really nice because it doesn't let things just fall into the abyss and not have action. We actually get emails saying, hey, this person's waiting for a response. How come they haven't gotten a response in a couple of days? And you know immediately when you email us on a new issue, you get an email back saying, hey, thank you for contacting us. Here's your ticket ID. Please talk to us you know, using this forum. Uh, that way we can work more effectively. Uh, now, the other thing we're doing is putting together a, a kind of a web-based database that will be not just listings, but will be the real-time data that's used for coordination. Uh, there's, uh, I kind of sat down and, and did a whole data map on this. We're working with a gentleman to do some programming right now. I'm working with him. We decided to do it in post uh, Postgres SQL instead of MySQL, so we're kind of having to learn that as <laughs> you know, a little bit of fun there. Uh, we have we have a, a sick idea of fun, I guess. <laughs> um, so we're learning some new things doing this. Um, so the current database that we got from the FRC scaled to one person. And it can't scale to multiple people. It just isn't possible. But you mean only one person at a time could actually do anything with it? Yeah. It, it, it couldn't be distributed in terms of, of, of people working on, you work on this part, I work on that part. What kind of shape was that database in? Was it useful information? There's a lot of useful information in there. However, we've seen uh, about... 50 to 60 percent inaccuracy, uh, whether it's uh, PL tones or frequencies or locations. Uh, there's stuff that's in there that says it's current that, you know, we have people saying, hey, this hasn't been on the air for five years uh, or 10 years in some cases. So I would like to really dispel the, the idea, you know, that people said, well, there was no frequencies available in like two meters anywhere in the state. Uh, there are. And now in certain areas, there's not. But there are in a lot of areas. Um, we're going to see you know, narrowband repeaters uh, come online as well. Uh, not saying that we are taking a position on narrowband. We just want to support both narrowband and wideband users. Narrowband being um, the, 
the 12 and a half kilohertz channels for analog? Yeah, narrowband. So UHF uh, in the state of Florida is a typically a 25 kilohertz channel, and then the narrowband is a 12 and a half kilohertz channel. So things like DMR, D-Star, uh, Yezu Fusion all run in a 12 and a half kilohertz channel, and so we can allocate a 12 and a half kilohertz channel now. VHF is a little bit different because uh, below 146 megahertz were 20 kilohertz wideband channels. Above 146 were 15 kilohertz channels, and then you know narrowband is half that. So it's it's kind of a hodgepodge of stuff that's been that way since the 60s. Obviously, if we were going to start over and redo it, uh, we'd probably do it a bit differently. But we, you know we don't have that luxury. Yeah. Um, most hams are, are going to have no concept of the experience of the concept of a narrowband analog FM. Are you, you going to try to do narrowband analog as well? Uh, so, if, if people want to do it, fine. Uh, we're actually taking the the FCC ignition designator as part of the application. We we streamlined the application information. Uh, essentially, what we're looking for is the latitude and longitude down to two decimal degrees. It gets us within about a quarter mile or a half mile of where it needs to be, which is fine for coordination purposes. Um, and we're actually building a, a model based off of a, a looser version of what's called TSB-88, same thing used for Part 90 uh, FB6 base codes. And this allows us to space repeaters a bit closer if we have to, um, rather than the 75 or 85 or even 120 mile spacing that the FRC used previously. The important thing with this is we're codifying this in a coordination policy. It, it's being written now. We need input from you know the users, uh, from the members, and and from the community at large as to you know what is what is the state of amateur radio. One of the things we've also come out with, and this is something that the previous FRC was talking about for about the last 15 years, was what's called a backyard repeater policy. A lot of people want a repeater. They want to put it at their house. They want to put it in their backyard. So we tried to figure out, well, what what is it really a backyard repeater? And this is very analogous to what the FCC uses in uh, itinerant frequencies. So we called it the itinerant repeater policy. We found a number of pairs just below 442 megahertz that had nothing on them anywhere in the state and said, if you want to put up a repeater, you know, no more than 50 feet high, no more than, I believe, 50 watts ERP, um, ideal for something in a ham fest or something like that, pick a channel. And there's wideband, there's narrowband, there's even a truly itinerant pair that's supposed to be used just for temporary repeaters. And you can register that uh, with us very easily. And you don't have to worry about you know interfering with somebody. You have to accept interference. And the nice thing is all the repeater channels are right next to each other. So if you do need to move, most of the time, the type of duplexer that's used, a notch duplexer, can easily move 100 kilohertz or so without having to retune it and affect your, uh, your you know, separation of, of your frequencies. Yeah, and this is not going to be one of those major public utility repeaters that thousands of people are, have programmed in their radios. It's going to be a three-user repeater, easy to move and change. Yeah, yeah, and everything is, is frequency out of mile for the most part. Very few people are still using crystal uh, repeaters. <laughs> uh, not to say that we don't want to support that, but I think the, the biggest problem we have is ICM has gone out of business now. Uh, International Crystal Manufacturing in the U.S., that was the kind of the last de facto standard for getting two-way crystals made for the old MyCores and things like that. And some of these old crystal radios are approaching 45 or 50 years old. Uh, even my, my chosen repeater that we use is a... Uh, is a Motorola Quantar, and that, that hasn't been produced for almost 10 years now. But it is synthesized. It, it is synthesized. Uh, you know, and the Yezu Fusion repeaters, all the kind of new ham radio repeaters, uh, stuff that the guys from Bridgecom are doing, are all synthesized. So it makes it uh, a little bit easier to be frequency agile. Yeah, no more GE Master Pros, guys. <laughs> no. Um, so the other thing we are really looking at, which is... Um, tone access or PL or some sort of an, uh, an access requirement on repeaters now. Um, previously, no new coordinations were granted without that, but a lot of stuff was, was grandfathered. 
This is one of the things we're really looking at, which is is how do we solve this? And I believe what we're going to is everybody needs to run both encode and decode PL. Um, what, what we're doing in terms of coordination takes advantage of FM capture effect of you know interference contours and service contours and things like that, where uh, you may not uh, hear or you 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 may not have a, a completely free channel in terms of not being able to hear somebody else on occasion. It'll be very weak though. Yeah. So so complaining about hearing your co-channel neighbor as you were driving around town is not an interference complaint anymore. Yeah, it, 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 it's not. And this, is, this has been kind of the standard with the um, commercial users for some time. And it's not actually <laughs> interference because so long as you're in the coverage area of your main repeater, the way we're engineering this, that repeater is always going to be at least 18 dB stronger than the interfering signal. And for FM, that's what you, you actually need 12 dB for the capture effect. So that gives us a little extra, uh, and most of the time it's going to be a non issue. I mean, we're talking a fairly weak signal in the first place, uh, but it, uh, for the first time allows us to actually model it. And the software that's available for this is, I mean, there's Splat, which is open source uh, under the GNU GPL, which is very important, um, or, you know, there's even Radio Mobile. It, it's all based on a, a concept called the Longley Rice model. Uh, this is kind of old stuff to anybody I involved in, in any commercial radio. So I think it's a first for somebody in amateur radio to actually be looking at modeling every repeater. And it's really neat. Once we have the models built, we can pull up adjacent channels and co-channel repeaters on you know, Google Earth, basically, and look at it and see what the contours look like. It makes a plot, colored plot on your on a map, and it shows where the overlaps are and makes it easy to see. Um, is the idea of uh, paper repeaters, repeaters that have been coordinated for years and years and haven't been on the air, is that the number one uh, sticky wicket? So, yeah, um, there's gonna, there, there's, there's certainly going to be some controversy here with this, and I, I don't think we're going to be able to make everybody happy. Um, but we're looking at a policy to, to really address that. The one thing I want to stress right now is if you had a coordinated repeater, you still do. We don't need to get a renewal on it. Uh, once we have the system in place, we're going to start sending out you know some renewal information, how to make it happen. Um, for the time being, though, don't worry about that. You're still coordinated. You're still good. As to the paper repeaters, the people that have a coordinated repeater that's been offline for you know years, basically, right now, if somebody actually approaches us and says, I want to put a repeater on this frequency, this guy's been offline for X number of years, the first thing we do is we'll reach out to the coordinated trustee and say, hey, what's, what's going on with your repeater? And we'll do that through the ticketing system. So you'll get a, an email, and we'll actually track it uh, and see, is it responded to? Then we'll follow up with the phone call, say, what's going on? Uh, is, this, is this online? Is it offline? And, you know, if we call and, you know, we're told, yeah, it's offline, we'll say, okay, how long has it been offline? And, and work through that. Long term, what this means is if you have a paper repeater, that's, that's going to be going away. We're not going to enable that. Uh, you're going to get, you know, 90 days basically to get it up online. And a lot of the times if somebody does lose a, like a tall tower site or something, you know, if you lose a thousand foot tower site, you're probably not going to be able to go back up on another thing you know, that high around there, if at all. Um, I'm not wanting to say that we're going to, you know, take away people's repeater pairs, because we can't do that. But in terms of coordination, yeah, you, you shouldn't be able to monopolize a frequency and not do anything with it. I think the issue has been, uh, other than just people being lazy about getting their stuff done, is if uh, your ha repeater has to come down and uh, you're worried about relinquishing the coordination because you could never get coordination because of this there aren't any more pairs left well with everybody hogging those pairs yeah there aren't any pairs left but if you effectively put in a system that makes sure all the frequencies are in use with repeaters that are actually on the air there's probably still going to be a pair left and if you have to relinquish your odds of being able to get back on the air sometime later when you can are getting better oh de definitely definitely now we really don't have, so I'm going to talk on UHF here, uh, 440 band. 
pretty much everywhere in the state with the exception of kind of southeast Florida, you know, Miami-Dade area, um, up the coast there, and the exception of maybe west central Florida, Tampa Bay, and Orlando areas, which, again, these are the major population areas of the state of Florida, uh, but we're a huge state. In most other areas, it's very easy to get coordination. Uh, we actually just found a couple pairs open in Miami. Uh, we did some coordination down there of uh, a smaller coverage area repeater, but it you know, fit in between two uh, repeaters very, very well and, and worked fine. Uh, I think we actually did a, just recently did a VHF coordination down in Miami of all places. So they're there and we just have to have to identify them. We, and as far as you know, are there paper repeaters in the Miami area, for example? Are there, are there frequencies that have been coordinated but haven't had anything on for years? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're aware of a few. Um, we're just not at that point where we can really start going after it. We're, we want to get the tools that enable us to work as an organization up and running, and that includes you know bylaws and membership and, and really the organizational stuff first and the database stuff. Start working with that. And then we can start addressing some of these bigger issues. You know, we have to have good data first before we can start going after the people that have, you know, the paper repeaters. Okay. So uh, the, with the dog catching the car, have you found yourself and the guys you're working with enthusiastic about doing this? Or are you going into a kicking and screaming because you won your fight and now you've got to put up or shut up? Well, yeah, that's, um, and I, I do want to clarify something. I think I said something that was a little wrong there. We're not coming after people that have paper repeaters. We're we're looking at, um, you know, if, if your repeater isn't going to be on the air, you know, you should really, in good amateur practice, you should relinquish the frequency and relinquish the coordination so that somebody else can, you know, if they want to put something up, can do it. We're noticing most repeaters sit unused most of the time. I've, I've kind of joked even that, you know, we could coordinate two repeaters you know, on different PL tones in the same city, and they would never notice it in a lot of cases. So, uh, you know, that's that's the thing I really want to tell the amateurs in Florida is get out there and use the repeaters. Have some, you know, QSOs on them. I remember 10 years ago being on repeaters and talking to people all over the place. You know, if DMR is your thing, get on the DMR repeaters. Make some noise. Uh, get on P25. Get on Fusion. Get on FM and, and have some fun with it. Now... Uh, I'm sorry, you just asked the about what we're doing for, uh, uh, was it the, the re-coordination there? Was, was well, it? what I was getting at was, uh, are, are, you, are you enthusiastic about what oh. you're doing? Or did you, did you okay, you, you got this thing, now you've got to perform. Yeah, yeah, we, we <laughs> uh, as it, you said, are, are, fun, are we but... enthusiastic about working coordination now? So... A, yeah, a lot of us are. We're actually looking for people that, that kind of want to get involved in, uh, you know, it, it's a thankless job. Uh, you have no uh, real authority to do anything. And you don't get a fancy title and don't get a high-vis vest, but we think it's very important work. And a lot of it takes um, a, a reasonable person and takes, uh, takes kind of a mediation aspect of it. Um, so... We would love to see more people get involved in it, and if you do, you know, you can say, hey, I, I want to help out. You know, here's my qualifications. We would love to have some people that have a background in, uh, you know, like RF propagation and stuff like that get involved that that know that and or at least want to learn that and what it means to, to do that. Uh, that. That being said, yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, and I'm not going to take on something that, I know I'm not going to be able to do. I like to uh, like to undercommit and overdeliver, and we've made some we've made a lot of progress. We're still actively coordinating repeaters, so uh, that's you know that's where we're at. And you know if, if I want to stress this too, we're an organization that takes ideas from our membership and from the amateur community. So if you have an idea, please propose it, um, and we'll track it and we'll get somebody working with you on it to to get it out there and you know is this something we need to see you know are we doing something wrong let us know and and let's work together because what we don't want to have happen is us to just kind of work as as the repeater gods and <laughs> and dictate because that's not how you get buy-in from the community uh at least you can say yeah you know we have a voice in this and we want to work together on it what kind of reaction are you getting 
from existing repeater owners? Are they checking out who you are and, and cooperating? So, yeah, I mean, the response has been, I think, very, very good. Uh, we have some people that are, are rightfully concerned, you know, hey, how do we renew our coordination? You know, what's going on with that? And we have some kind of frequently asked questions on our website. Um, but that's why, you know, I, I want to tell the current repeater owners, the people that are coordinated, don't worry about your coordination. We're not revoking coordinations. Um, you know, that that's it. Uh, most of the response has been great. Uh, there's, there's, you're never going to be popular with everybody. Um, and I, I know uh, that's why you know, I tried to get a lot of different people involved in this. Uh, I, I got to say, our, our chairman, John Pearl, is just a great guy. Uh, and he is uh, excellent at running meetings and things like that. He's actually very, very good at the job. Uh, Lou Romero, W4LT, uh, he's. He's been great to work with. He's helping out with coordinations. His background's in broadcast engineering. Um, you know, Steve Zingman's involved quite a bit. Uh, and, and these are all people that are, are involved in amateur radio. I think I'm forgetting somebody in there. But uh, we have other people that have you know, kind of asked not to be named because they're just doing kind of the eyes and ears of the organization, which is fine as well. Have you guys, have you guys th thought about... Um, joining Sarah and becoming, you know, f filling out the rest of the Southeast except for Alabama? So, you know, I've actually talked with a couple of people at Sarah, and they, they seem to be very enthusiastic about what they're doing. Um, you know, when I was there, they were, the, the number one thing they were scared of is if Florida wanted to join Sarah, because <laughs> it would be the tail wagging the dog. Yeah, um, and the issue with Sarah is, you know, I, I reviewed a lot of their bylaws, and it, it seemed to be maybe they're effective, but we might be trading, uh, you know, the, the devil we know versus for the devil we don't, just for the sake of change. And I think it's very important to have an open organization, and, um, you know, if Sarah works up there, uh, that's fine. We're actually working with Sarah on the border. Uh, if you're within 100 miles of, of the border, uh, we notify Sarah and say, hey, here's a prior coordination notice. Um, they they're, they do the same thing that the FRC did in terms of coordination. Uh, they just look at height versus uh, spacing for cold channel. Uh, and they don't really take anything more than that into account. Because so, they've got lots of new tools that they've been using for you know, looking at the same thing at, you know, at, at uh, contours and you know, a fairly advanced way to figure things out. Plus, I haven't seen it, haven't worked with it, but a new, new online system for doing coordinations. Yes. So I, I actually looked at their system, and um, it was it's a plug-in for WordPress, which is a very popular content management system. We actually use WordPress for the um, FASMA website right now. Um, and it, it's um, it's something they wrote. It, it's a, a kind of a order management system for them. Uh, it doesn't seem to really automate the... Uh, the generation of, of maps and so forth. I, I didn't see that functionality in it, but you know, I we're doing our own thing down here, and uh, you know, I wish Sarah the the best up there. Uh, we're we're happy to work with them. I, I yeah, well, I, with a big border, you have to. Yeah, 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 and the well, RF doesn't respect the border. <laughs> that, certainly, and we're also working with the uh, the guys up in Alabama, the Alabama Repeater Council. Um, I think there's even. Mississippi, that's... Uh, Mississippi, Sarah. Yeah, that's Sarah. Alabama is the one that's out. So, and, and they're 20 kilohertz across across the band where they can be. Yeah, uh, which, which is... Which makes it, it, it a little, you know, sort of the odd state out in this, this part of the world. Yeah. It, actually, uh, you know, on UHF, 20 kilohertz, I don't know, makes but a lot of sense. I'm talking about two meters. Oh, on two meters. Yeah. Even. Okay. Even, huh. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> well, um, the good thing is that's not a huge population center for us. It's not... A huge population center for for Sierra either, so we don't have a lot of contention up there. It's, it's probably one of the saving graces of that. Okay. So the last thing um, you had surprised me uh, when you were saying that um, our that our finder wanted exclusivity of data. I know that when ARL turned things over to our finder to be the ARL's repeater directory, um, it has made a lot of frequency coordinator groups unhappy. And I don't really know why exclusivity may be part of it. What have, what have you learned about that? So, well, I, I don't know if that's, if that's the reason. I know the FRC previously 
voted to not participate with the ARRL's uh, vendor in that, re- uh, R-Finder in that, that regard. Um, in, it was under the previous board, of course. Now, uh, from our perspective, which is one of, we don't like secrecy, okay? And, and we want people to be able to access our data and access it freely. Because, you know, they want to know how to program their radios. Saying, well, hey, you have to go out and use our finder for access to our data um, is, well, it's against our founding documents. That's, that's the big thing right there. We just can't give an exclusivity to public information. Yeah, my impression was that uh, in the past, ARL was not being exclusive. They copyrighted their directory and... Um, you can copyright a format. You can't copyright information. So people liberally borrowed information from it. If they were smart, they seeded it with some bad information just to know who was stealing from them. But um, every uh, repeater councils all over the place, except for Sarah, published information on their websites. It was all open and freely accessed, even while they were being paid by the ARL. So if they, uh, things have changed in that regard. I'm not familiar with it. But... Um, you know, it's kind of a shame. It, it's a good tool, and I noticed when I got into Florida and tried to look up repeaters on it, it was mostly empty. <laughs> a lot of a lot of missing repeater information. Not, well, I was looking on 220. Oh, it was mostly empty. Well, I, I I have I have to plug uh, our our personal uh, club here in in Tampa, Florida Simulcast Group. We have a repeater 224280, uh, one uh, 146.2. Uh, it's up about 500 feet, probably one of the best 220 machines in the state. Yep. But I figured, I was going through Jacksonville, and I figured there was more than one 220 repeater in Jacksonville. Uh, yeah, you know, in a lot of areas, 220, I, I don't know, I like 220 a lot. If you so. want a pair, get on 220. Yeah, it, it, it truly, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, it's a great band. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of cool stuff out there for 220, um, especially some of the stuff that, um, oh, uh, uh, what is it, the guys making uh, Bridgecom. I've tested a few of their radios. I have a few Motorola's on 220. It's a great band. But, anyways, um, as to the openness of the information, yeah, that was, you know, I, I've talked with uh, is it Bob. Yeah, Greenberg? Bob Green, Green Greenberg. 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 Okay, Bob Greenberg. Um, I knew his name was Bob. Uh, and uh, nice guy. Uh, everything's great. Um, and I, I've told him. I said I want to make our information once it's compiled open to you guys, but they'll. You know they're not going to pay for it unless it's exclusive to them. They okay. want to pay for the exclusivity. Do you care whether you get paid for it or not? Not particularly. Uh, I, I would like to have the writing is on the wall about this data. Is the ARRL used to pay you know two dollars per listing? Then it was a buck fifty. Then it was a dollar. Then it was fifty <laughs> cents. So you know it, it's obvious that this is kind of going that way. So we want to make it make it available uh, to not just our members and published in a format. You know. You should be able to download it as you know JSON data or um, you know a CSV or something like that, and just be able to import it into your you know your chirp program or whatever and program your radio. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we're doing is part of our our web based interface uh, that we're building is going to have the ability for the trustees or the technical people responsible for their individual repeater to get in there and update things like. Their their Echolink node number or their All Starlink node number or you know anything that doesn't impact the actual RF model and the coordination you can update and you don't need to get approved and the most current data will always be on that website and then you know if if somebody wants to pull that like a repeated book or whoever I mean it's an assortment of data you can't copyright it. and you know we we of course. Uh, we're 501c3, so we'll certainly accept donations if somebody <laughs> wants to use it, and would really encourage that because there's a lot of work in this, um, and some expense, and, 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 and some expense. But we're hoping the membership will see that and, and cover that as well. We're, you know, it, it's important for a nonprofit to have a, a funding method figured out, and you know, we're we're getting to that point. So. All right, so um, let's see. There's a few pairs on 70 centimeters available, even in the big metros. Two meters, apparently not so much still. It's uh, going to have a hard time finding a new pair in Miami, uh, Tampa, and uh, what, Jacksonville is the third big metro? Uh, well, Orlando. Orlando. I, I yeah. think Jacksonville is, is fairly, we could probably find something up there. But that being said, a lot of that is for people looking for repeaters. Figure out what's online. A lot of times... 
stuff isn't online and hasn't been online for some time. We're just going based on old data. Um, and, you know, if, if we can find somebody that says, yeah, my repeater's offline. It's been offline for the last three years. And, you know, we lost our site, but we want to keep the pair. Well, you know, we're, we're going to have to talk about that because if somebody else comes to us and says, well, we want to put something up, we're ready to go, we have a site, you know, it, it, it gets, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to make somebody unhappy, but I think in general it's going to make ham radio better. Yeah, that, that is a fight that you can't avoid everywhere forever because you will get that ham that says, I want that pair and I will get something back on. And they say the same thing next year and the next year, and they still haven't got it back on. But they will fight tooth and nail to keep it. You know, it, I'll relate to this. I, I was at uh, Ham Fest uh, locally uh, around where I live, uh, and I had a o- older uh, gentleman come up to me and uh, pull my arm a little bit and kind of joke and say, I don't know if he was joking or kind of, it was a little strange. He says, yeah, I like that, that, that repeater you got, that UHF one up in Tampa. You know, that's on my pair, by the way. And uh, I'm like, what? yeah, I was like, I didn't know. I got coordinated on that pair. Uh, what do you mean your pair? He said, oh, I had a repeater there 20 years ago, and I've always had something on that pair. Blah, blah, blah. He's like, your machine gets out really well, though. I like it. I said, oh, okay, thank you. So just, <laughs> you're welcome oh. to use it. Yeah, yeah. I said, you're welcome to get on there and use it. And, you know, it was it was kind of funny. It's, oh, you know, that's, that's my pair. I'm like, well, okay, maybe it was back in 1970, but... You know, I'm not looking to throw people off where they've been, and, and that's not something we're going to do or condone. But we need to be realistic. Is If you don't have something on there and you don't have a site, you know, maybe it would be fine. If you want to repeat it at your house, we'll, we'll find you a pair that will work there. Yeah, but not 146.94. Hey, not, yeah, I mean, it, we would really suggest if you're going for that backyard repeater, you put it on UHF. Uh, or 220. 220. Or, or 220. 220 is a great band, you yeah. know. It, and it's it's amazing what a repeater 50 feet up on 220 can cover. You can cover an entire, you know, county down here with that, no problem. And, heck, 220, you probably don't even have to worry about, co- I mean, I don't believe we have enough 220 repeaters in the state to have to worry about co-channel 220 interference <laughs> contours at all. Maybe that's why I couldn't find anything in, yeah. in our finder. I, I, that, that, that could be. I, it's, it's interesting you got on 220. I re, like I said, I really like the 220 that's band. That's the top radio in my stack. That's a great great radio. Uh, what, what do you actually use for 220? It's a uh, Delinco. Oh, Back okay. when they were about the only one selling one. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, I got a, got a few of those. Uh, I got... Uh, this, this is just great little radios. I've, I've got two, two ICOM 38As, a, uh, a Kenwood, which is now dead. Uh, two, two Kenwood F6 Handy Talkies. Hmm. My first 220 radio was a Midland 13509. That's a little before my time, but yeah, I, I... that was the mid-1970s, 12-channel crystal-controlled radio, and oh, we, yeah. we got into 220 pretty big in Chicago, so... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah 220 in Chicago was, was really big. I, I know... I actually know somebody up there in Northwest Indiana still has a 220 repeater of all things, so... Um, but, yeah, so, so yeah, we're, like I said, there, there's going to be some disagreement and I would like to have a policy in place so that we can address that in an even handed manner. We're not playing favoritism. Um, we're not discriminating on you know, national origin. It, anything that you could consider discrimination other than is this thing compliant with the FCC rules for an amateur radio repeater will help you coordinate it. Um, that's, I just want to stress that is we are here to help radio amateurs in the state of Florida. One of the things that, that uh, may be the uh, uh, the biggest symbol of the transition actually being accomplished is that, uh, well, you have your own new website. The URL for the old one, florida-repeaters.com, points to your group now, right? So you got that URL, and that can be a hard thing to get if someone doesn't want to let go. Uh, yeah, so it, it's florida-repeaters.org. Uh, .org. Point, yeah, .org points to, uh, if you actually go there, it'll go to a specific page on our website. Um, so, like I said, we did get it transitioned. Uh, there and and was, what, is, what is the current website? The current website is fasma.org. Um, so just, just the initials, F- F-A-S-M-A. F-A-S-M-A. Yeah, .org. Dot org. And, um, you know, go there. And Fortunately, it didn't spell a word, otherwise you'd never be able to get that. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, I, I tried to do something that was, you know, inclusive. 
and different and described it. And fortunately, Florida Amateur Spectrum Management Association sounds like a kind of a mouthful. It doesn't fit on a banner nicely, but FASMA does. And, uh, you know, we wanted something that wasn't uh, it was going to work uh, in, in English and, and possibly also Spanish as well. Um, because we do have a large Spanish-speaking population in, in South Florida. Yep. And, you know, they, they have as much right to uh, operate a Spanish language repeater as you do a English language repeater or a bilingual repeater in the state, uh, or even a French repeater if you want to. Uh, I think the only FCC requirement is you have to identify in English, um, the English language. I so, wonder if, if in uh, Puerto Rico if they require identifying in English. I, I, I believe it's U- U.S. Yeah, it's the FCC. Interesting. Uh, Didn't mean to go go there, but it yeah. just occurred to me. Well, you know, because that's it, not their native language. It would be. Um, it, it's. I. I think most people uh, involved in telecommunications do do speak English. I know when I go to about to give your call sign. That would be yeah. Hard, go but. give your call sign in you know English and you know the phonetic alphabet's always the same in English or Spanish. It's it's always the same phonetic alphabet for the yeah. ITU. Uh, I. It's actually funny when I go to. Um, uh, Mexico or something for work, and you know, I, uh, what I do, I actually find myself speaking English to you know the room because what well, we're talking about, uh, you know, the internet and things like that, and it's just you know, uh, ironically, all the technical words are you know, high yeah, high in English. I, well, I, I think uh, I, ironically, you'd call that the uh, what was it the lingua franca of, of the internet is English, yeah, which would be the, and the French language. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Literally, I think. But uh, <laughs> an excellent point. Yeah. I, so that's what I just want to stress is that we are an inclusive organization. We're working for all amateurs, no matter you know any of that. Um, and that's going to be one of the things that's very prominent in our, our new bylaws is an adoption of uh, you know non discrimination policy. Uh, everybody's equal, and we're going to use equal standards with everybody. There's no okay. favoritism. Well, back when it was still a controversy and you were you know, still fighting to, to get recognized and to get things done that you needed to get done, I was interested in the controversy. I was particularly interested when it appeared and it has been, has been solved and uh, things are, are progressing and moving forward. So I think that is, in, in terms of good things happening in ham radio, that's an excellent one. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean... It's pretty much all been positive. Um, you know, of course, some of the guys that were involved previously don't see it as such. But, uh, you know, we're, by and large, the people that came by the booth, this is the first time in, I think, 20 years there's actually been a booth for the Spectrum, man- you know, FRC or FASM or whoever doing repeater coordination at a ham fest. You know, come by and talk. Previously, they had, a, like, a members meeting, which was a, was a bad forum to, uh, you know, address issues when people need to talk for more than five minutes and it was very contentious to do that under Robert Trull's border and things like that yeah. so we um, we find it, it's better to talk with our, our membership and address their specific issues and take some notes on it than trying to do that in, you know, in an open forum and everybody's you know got other stuff they need to, to address and it just you're asking people to come by and sit there for two hours and listen to everybody else's problem to get their <laughs> own problem addressed. Where yeah, that is kind of painful. Yeah, where we can just uh, do that. Typical city council. Yeah, we we wanted to avoid that. So the other thing we're going to be doing is when we do have members meetings, we're going to make certain that they're they're announced properly, and that they're you know available to dial in via phone or like WebEx or something like that. Yeah, you got the technology. Might as well use it. It's a big. It is a big state. It takes a long time to get from one side to the other. Yeah, yeah. Or from north to south. I, you know, I, I, I fly quite a bit, so it, it's a big state. So, uh, and and we want input from everybody in every corner of the state. That's you know that, that, that's what's important. All right. So I always have my guests face this direction up against the curtains or the wall or something, so they're not distracted by people photobombing and stuff behind them. But if you look behind me, you'll discover that the ham fest has ended. For the day, it's gone. There's oh, nobody, wow. nobody okay. left behind you. Yeah, I know. I need to uh, need to go pack up our stuff, and yep. I think we're going to grab uh, grab dinner here now. So, all right. Well, thanks for coming by. I appreciate uh, the update, and uh, we will let you go. Okay, I really really appreciate being here, and uh, I I really enjoy uh, Ham Radio now, and I subscribe to you guys on YouTube, and and it's it's great stuff. So. Are you going to go to Albuquerque to the Tampa um, conference? I I would like to. I got to see what my schedule is for work. 
Uh, I've, uh, like I said, I, I've I've been on a lot of flights this year so far, and it's it's not <laughs> looking like it's going to slow down. So, right. you, have, you have a real job. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. Some days I, I I don't know if it's a real job, but it's it's certainly a job <laughs> that gets me around. Keeps so. you busy. Yeah. All right. So Brian Fields, W nine CR Brian with a Y, Florida Spectrum. Florida Amateur Spectrum Management Association. Congratulations. And uh, so let's see. I would be this guy. Gary Pierce, scan for iq Ham Radio Now is brought to you by you. Free to, free to make. No, free to watch. Not free to make. If you enjoy the programs, hamradionow.tv, go click the pig. That is it. Over and out. Goodbye, Facebook. Goodbye, Harvey.